Hey, Amanda, how are you? Hey, how are you doing, Sammy? I'm doing well. Appreciate your time today. I'm really excited for this conversation to talk to you and get to know a little bit more about you for our audience. So tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, most excitingly, definitely the name of NFA, your company. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Dr. Amanda Variantes. I am the founder and CEO of NFA Money, which stands for No Fucking Around Money. <laughs> and I help coaches and online entrepreneurs align their energy, mindset, and business building habits to make more money doing what they love more easily, faster, with less stress using moneymaker methods that I've created over time after working with lots of entrepreneurs and helping them break through to whatever level of income that they want to create. Awesome. Awesome. And so there's a lot right there that went into the, whether it be the blocks, whether it be the mindset, whether it be the income levels that people are getting that they're targeting. And so I guess the, where's the first step when you're having a client that you're wanting to talk to, which part is the first thing to identify and tackle? Always energy and mindset. Okay. Yeah. You see I that see pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because I have a lot of people come to me and they, let's say they're really successful in their business. Like they've gotten to six figures and they're, they find me in fun ways where they go, I heard what you were talking about. And I feel that. And usually it's that they're working too hard for the money they make. And it doesn't really matter what level they're at. They could be working really hard and making 20 grand a year, or they could be working really hard and making a million dollars a year. They could be working really easily and making $10 million a year. You know, it, it's all about energetic and mindset alignment. And so when people are stuck and not able to get what they want, I always know that it's unconscious blocks and what I call competing commitments. So 95% of us is run from our unconscious belief system and 5% of us by our conscious. So if we're saying one thing and getting another, it means that we have competing commitments. So I help people unblock those, which is a mindset and energetic alignment thing. And then what happens is you get into inspired, spontaneous action and you're more magnetic because you're living in your zone of genius. And then the money comes a lot more easily. Okay, cool. So that's how that's describing flow, right? The zone of genius is a synonym of that, right? Definitely. Yeah. Gay Hendricks wrote a book called The Big Leap and he coined the term zone of genius. And it's about absolutely getting into a flow state where you'll know when you're in your zone of genius because things will feel easy, flowing, joyful, magnetic. It's like you could do this all day for the rest of your life and you would do it for free because you enjoy it. That's a great point. I think that's what the purpose part of the five categories of success is. It's to be in that zone, but you also mentioned your mindset and that's part of mental health. And the other three categories being money, obviously physical and mental health go together in one category, relationships, and then overall happiness are the five. And you touched on a few different ones there. So I want, I'm always curious to ask my guests, what's the importance for you if you had to rank them? In order of importance of all five? Well, that's an interesting one because in my mind, it's the holistic combination of all of those. When you're in your zone of genius, you're going to be at a 10 in all of those areas because mm -hmm. you're going to, you love what you're doing. You love yourself. You want to nurture your mind, which creates happiness, which creates win-win relationships, which creates greater income. So it's in my mind, those are all very aligned and you can't really separate them because, you know, you don't want to live a life where you're like, oh yeah, I'm rocking it in money, but my health is deteriorating or, right. oh, I'm really healthy, but I'm poor and I have no way to do the things I want to do in my life. And when I say poor, like financially poor. So right. In my mind, they all are really integrated. Yeah. I mean, that, that's definitely a trick question. Like happiness for me is the end goal, but you need the other four in order to be successful and to be happy. And so they're all intertwined, but everybody has a kind of something that they need to target first to improve on, and that'll help them in their other areas. But talk to me a little bit about your journey. I know you had started a little bit on the financially poor side, and then now look at you, you're all making it in the industry and in your business. So talk to us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that because you're so right. So for me, it actually started with relationship challenges. So I left my 15 year marriage having an affair. And then my next relationship was completely falling apart, which I didn't have good relationship skills, didn't know how to handle it well. So I was on the floor crying one night and facing homelessness. Like my relationships are falling apart. I'm like sitting there going, I don't know where I'm going to live because I lived in a really expensive area. I have three kids 
And here I am just going, oh crap. And I had this revelation that I'm the center of all the problems. So I was like, huh, this is what's the common denominator here. It's me. And so I thought I, I gotta do something different. I was always a high drive person. So I was in grad school with three kids and I was making it through grad school to get my doctorate. And so I was powerful in that way and accomplishing goals that I set up in, in an academic and kind of career type of pursuit, but it wasn't turning into money. And it was definitely, I was very disconnected and understanding how to have good, connected, healthy relationships. And so I started, I decided oh, I've got to do whatever it takes. And I started listening to podcasts and because to me, podcasts are such a brilliant gift to the world because it's learning on the go and it's free. And so I listened to oh, tons of relationship podcasts and that led me into wealth development because I was in this relationship workshop and I realized that wealth building was nowhere on my value system. And I was like, oh, interesting. Like you can learn learn how to be wealthy. <laughs> and so I started learning relationship skills and money skills. And then my whole life started to change. And then I decided, oh, wow, I really want to help other people with these things. And so I went into, I decided when I graduated with my PhD, to, instead of going the academic route to take the leap and build a business. And in my first full-time year, I made six figures and then have just, that's just led me on this amazing journey of helping other people do what I did. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about that. And obviously no fucking around money is the business that you're helping entrepreneurs. Is it only entrepreneurs? Is it people who are maybe in their corporate job that think they have these money blocks or competing conflicts? What is your target there that you're trying to help on? I do work. Ex I don't work exclusively with coaches and online entrepreneurs, but I market to coaches and online entrepreneurs. So every once in a while, yeah, I'll get a corporate client and work with them, but I definitely, most of my programs are designed around coaches and on online entrepreneurs because they have very similar blocks in the way that they overwork and over deliver, get underpaid, high drive, high stress often. Those money blocks where they want to make a lot of money serving the world, doing what they enjoy, but they oftentimes aren't doing what they really enjoy. There's a lot of shoulds going on for them. And then on the flip side of that, they're also just feeling resentful and burnt out and frustrated because they're putting a lot of time and energy in and not getting the out the ROI that they want. Okay. Makes sense. So what are the main money blocks? Let's just lay them out now and then we'll go into how to identify each of them within yourself. Yeah. So the top three money blocks are money is bad, money is scarce, and money causes stress. And these show up across your life course over and over again. So you never eliminate your money blocks completely. It's not like you all of a sudden you go, oh, I've completely gotten rid of this one. You evolve through them and every step that you take along your journey, you, I like to call it quantum leaping, like you quantum leap to the next level of yourself and then you'll discover a money block coming back up in a new way. And examples of that would be like when you first start your business, you might have a lot of imposter syndrome running. So you work really hard and then you have that association with the money block that money causes stress or money is scarce. And so that brings up some stuff. And then you break through, let's say to the, let's say you break through the million dollar mark and all of a sudden it comes up like, oh, money's bad. Oh no, people are going to think I'm a greedy jerk. I'm afraid about shining other people. So they show up in new ways across your life course. The thing that's really cool is that you can learn strategies that I teach people to overcome them more quickly so that they don't keep you stuck. And it's, the unconscious is cool because it's this never ending puzzle of yourself that you keep getting to unfold and up level. And I don't think we ever get there all the way where you're like, oh, I'm amazing. And I have everything figured out. It's a constant journey and practice. Yeah. So I agree. Self-identification is the number one thing. You got to be self-aware. We talked about that in a previous episode. That's the first cornerstone. And then you use the motivation and the discipline to start to attack that. But you need a strategy of what to do when you, okay, money is the root of all evil. Let's take that one, for example, or money is, money is bad. I think is the way you worded it, but it's the identification that you don't want to go out and chase it because it's bad. And therefore, if you have it, then they'll, you'll be bad. So you're going to subconsciously maybe not chase as much as you think you should. And then all of a sudden, like you said, you're trapped in that competing con commitment. So once you identify that that's a problem that you have, how do you start to make the first actionable item to start to take a step back and overstep those boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. One clarification too, is that it might not even be that you chase money. Let's say you get an inheritance 
you will self-sabotage and lose the money because you're afraid of being seen as bad or turning it changing your identity or people not liking you or things like that so all of these will end up causing some version of self-sabotage because if you imagine you have the subconscious belief that money is bad you don't want to turn into what you fear or hate so you're going to figure out a way to push it away yeah. so you might be able to attract a lot of money but you'll end up self-sabotaging and losing it somehow or just feeling really bad about it and you can't enjoy the money and i think of money blocks as not only that it's the ways that you feel about your money it's the way you earn spend save invest and then it's also the way you feel about it because you could be a mega multimillionaire and feel really bad about it you could be poor and feel bad about it and alternatively you could have the flip side of that where you're working through your money blocks and you're conscious of them and you could be poor and feel super happy and you could and when i say poor you could obviously if you're struggling to eat you're probably not going to be very happy <laughs> right. but you could be stable financially and feel really great or you could have millions and feel really great and all of those things could be true you have money blocks when you don't feel good about money in general and the money blocks will show up differently based on your belief systems so there's that i will say when the first step is always con is always consciousness raising so first it's questioning what do i believe about money it's really amazing to work with people from all over the world and in different walks of life and in different stages of business and ask them that question and they go god i never really thought about what where did I get my money beliefs? Why do I believe this? Where did this come from? We mm -hmm. tend to just be in the wash of money and do a whole bunch of activities around money and yep. have a lot of unconscious thoughts about it. And then just assume that we should be better at it. So it's a really shameful conversation for a lot of people. And I often say that the things that we never want to talk about at the dinner table are sex and money. Yep. <laughs> and it's just like, we have so much shame around it. And so it's why people stay stuck unnecessarily long because they don't know who to talk to about it. And they there's a lot of embarrassment and guilt and fear and uncertainty and so then they stay stuck and continue to play out those stories so for anyone with any of these money blocks you want to just start to question your beliefs and what do i believe about money why do i believe this about money and do i want to keep running this story is it story or is it truth and 99 percent of the time when it's a disempowering limiting belief you're going to come up with the reality that oh this isn't true i i actually learned this when i watched my parents fighting and i developed the belief that money causes stress or when i went to church and was told money is the root of all evil or like we develop these stories when we're young kids and then play them out over and over in repeated patterns across our life course for sure yeah i think that's a big one like you don't realize how much your society and your environment around you, as well as your parents and either your church or your mosque or whatever, the kind of other surrounding establishments that you go to constantly can have an impact on your belief system or on money. And at the end of the day, it's just, it's a tool that you can use to do what you want in life. And that's why you need a certain amount of it. And that certain amount can differ based on your goals and what you want to do. So yeah it shouldn't be more complicated than that but i think it's the fact that we don't have these conversations like you're saying is probably the big reason why it gets perpetuated across the different generations yeah absolutely yeah carl jung is his, my favorite quote of all time he says until you make the unconscious conscious it will direct your life and you will call it fate and it's exactly what you're talking about, right? It's yeah. just like we don't make it conscious so then it just keeps running over and we think oh this is just the way that it is yeah yeah carl jung is awesome by the way yeah his work. but right. i like to i like to switch gears and we obviously have some guest questions they like to bring on if everybody who wants to ask a question you can either dm me on instagram or send me an email at financezilla gmail.com this one is from arib he wanted to ask what are the main slash best go-to market strategies and why or if does the timing matter? Interesting questions. These are great. I have a question for you real quick. So when you're putting a guest on, do you blast out questions for them to ask that particular guest? Or is it like, oh, very cool. Yeah. Like I have, I had some guests as they wanted to ask about marketing or they wanted to ask about online business and commerce. So I figured you'd be a good guest to help answer them. Nice. Very cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So let's say best main go-to strategies. First, I will say 
one of the number one mistakes I see entrepreneurs make in their marketing is scattered thinking, confusion around their message, confusion about who they're talking to, which I think of as a competing commitment as well. There's this fear of niching down because we go, oh no, I'm going to miss out. It's a real scarcity issue, right? We go, if I only, if I market to everyone and serve everyone, then somehow I'll have enough business. And it's actually the opposite in a lot of ways, because when you don't know who you're talking to, it's really hard to have a direct, clear conversation where people aren't confused. And then when you don't, when you don't have a clear message on your, any of your marketing material, people don't know what you're offering and confused people don't buy. So you want to make sure that when someone goes to something of yours, it's so clear within three seconds, you have three seconds to get their attention that they know exactly who you're talking to and the result that they're going to get when they're working with you or when they're coming to buy your product or service. And so that people really struggle with that. They want to over explain and they want to say, mm -hmm. I do everything. And they want to try to talk to everyone. And then they end up talking to no one. So that's my answer there in terms of marketing strategy, get really clear on who you're working with and the result you're offering. And then on the, does timing matter? I would want to know more information in this question. I don't know exactly what they mean by that exactly, but I would say, yeah, as a, as a go for it, yeah, you want so, to make an addition. Yeah, let, let me help maybe add a little bit more color to it. So the timing of a go-to-market strategy, call it, let's say an online course or mm -hmm. an ebook or something like that, that you want to, you want to start the process of making a go-to-market strategy and then you have to make sure either, whether it be the timing, is it January is better? Is it seasonality? Is it a good? Thanksgiving type Black Friday deal? Is it something that, does that even matter? And you could just always do a sale later. And it's more about how you're able to add value beforehand so that you can increase awareness. What is the best type of strategy that way for the timing? Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. I would say that the, the strategies that work the best are always going to be about timeless clarity around your clients and customers knowing and how to read their mind. And that's because you know them so well, yeah. that human behavior, that it doesn't matter when you launch a program, you just speak to that human behavior principles, such as people are going to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Okay. So people are, that's always what they're looking for, right? right? They're looking for you to help them find a result to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And so whenever you launch something, the most important thing is speaking to the right people in their hot spots and then creating urgency for them to get the result from you. You could, I've seen people in very challenging times, make millions of dollars knowing how to do that well. And it isn't about the timing of it. It's about the awareness of what the, their target clients want. Okay. And if it's a, I don't know if it's necessarily a money block, but maybe it's a subconscious thing just to play devil's advocate of somebody who you, maybe you don't want to focus in on the pain that they're having so that you can market and sell to that pain and your product will come and help them. For example, sometimes some strategies are to make them feel that they're in a little bit of pain so that you, their product, they can see the need for the product and to create that desire. And if the person inside is like, I don't really want to, I feel like that's taken advantage of, how do you get them over that? Cause that will be a big hurdle when you're trying to sell a product. I would imagine. I'm trying to think of you of an example you're thinking of so I can understand it better because in, in my mind, I go, you're not, it's not that you're, you're causing them to be in pain. You're helping them see their pain points so that they are looking for a solution and you're providing the solution for them. It, so say more. Help yeah. me understand where you want. So, where you're going. no, I think that's a good that's a good reframing of the question because there's always these courses that come up and be like essentially you need this or else you always stay broke. For example, right? It's a sales strategy to make you feel like you're going to be broke if you don't have this one product that'll help you make it rich. And obviously, that's not a quantifiable number because that's different for every person. But the focus in on you desperately need this and your life isn't good enough because you don't have it type of thing. See that a little bit more nowadays and maybe that's just a clickbait, but it's just some people yeah. are not comfortable going that extreme because it feels like they're taking advantage of the person, of the consumer. I would say the only reason you're ever going to feel like you're taking advantage of the consumer is if you're not delivering the results that you say you can deliver. You yeah. know, if you are, then it's a win-win situation. So if you're feeling 
like, oh my God, I'm taking advantage of you. And if this is just clickbait, then maybe you have a product or service that isn't really giving people results and you're just looking for quick sales. Your business mm -hmm. won't last because you're not going to build a reputation of success. Yeah, that's fair. That's a good point. Okay. And then we have another question from Ella. It's what does it take to run a successful slash profitable e-commerce slash service-based business in the early stages? Obviously you've had a good deal of success in that being able to make six figures in the first year. So I figured this would be a good, this would be a good question for you to help it's answer a as well. Huge question. <laughs> it is a good one. It's, it's a good and huge question. It's like, oh, that's what I teach people <laughs> for a year straight. I would say the core root is first the decision that you're dedicated to the long-term quest and that you're committed and you take daily action. If you are willing, I, I tell people, I call it a success, my success formula. It's compound. It's a compounding interest formula, which is if you take daily strategic action over time, your success is inevitable. So daily strategic action over time is going to equally successful business. People where people get stuck. I don't know if you've read Atomic Habits in of his chapters, and I can't remember the scholar he's quoting, but it, he has a chart of, it, they call it the Valley of Disappointment. And so it's like, it, it, most people think you're going to have straight line success. Like yeah. I get in and I put my heart and soul into it and all of a sudden the money comes. That's not how it works. In the beginning, actually, you often have a dip. You're putting in time, energy, sometimes money, and you feel like, oh, wow, the curve is going downward because you're not getting the ROI yet. Most people give up before they have the upward exponential success because in that valley of disappointment, I like to call it the valley of despair. It's like you get desperate, you get fearful, you don't know what's going to happen. You're not sure about the outcome. And most people give up there and they... And what they don't realize is if stay in the game, be committed to be determined. Now, this also means as a startup business, do you have a transition strategy? Because I also see people sometimes jump ship too quickly from their job. And then they are freaked out about the money to where it repels money away from them. And then they have to go back and get the job and this cycle keeps going. Right. So you want to have a transition plan. I don't tell people to take the leap out of their job unless they have a transition plan. For me, when I did it, I luckily, because I had lived on food stamps and lived a very simple life for quite a while. I didn't need a lot of money per month. And I knew I had a couple months of living money saved up. And I was like, okay, I got to get a couple clients to pay for the next month. And if I can do that, then my business will be successful. If you're someone who's in a corporate position or you have a higher paying job and you're looking to replace that income and you jump ship and you're like in one month, I'm going to make all the money to replace that. That's an unrealistic expectation. Right. You're going to cause yourself to go into this fear-based sabotage and you won't be successful. So have a transition plan and then stay committed and dedicated, determined over the long haul and your success will be inevitable. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's the same thing we always talk about on the show is 1% better every day, week, and then eventually you'll be hundreds of percent better every by the end of the year and over a decade, yeah. you'll be a different person. So I definitely think it's, you just got to stay in the game long enough and eventually the competition will give up and different ones will sprout up and different ones will give up. You got to stay in it long enough, but I could see why you named your company no fucking around. You definitely seem like you're a person who can just stay on track and not let anybody get distracted. Is that kind of what allowed you to come up with that name is it just that you thought it would be a good little hook because it definitely is but it's also <laughs> part of your character there's actually a really fun story around it when i was a kid in high school there was a rec league volleyball there was like a volleyball rec league and i wanted to join and you had to have at least one adult on the league because it was an adult league tournament thing and i was like dad you be the adult and i'll get all my friends together and we'll kick ass he's like, okay so we did it and when we were coming up with their name i was like let's call ourselves team nfa because you know we couldn't swear at the rec center yeah. so we called ourselves teams and team nfa and then of course we won because it was a whole bunch of high school kids beating adults on yeah. a rec league <laughs> and then every athletic team that i created after that i would always call us team nfa and then i was coaching a client one day and he said oh you're like my tough love dad but you're also really soft and sensitive and it really works for me and i was like i'm not fucking around about your transformation i really care and it was just this interesting moment. And then I was at a chamber of commerce event and I shared this with somebody and they're like, kind of, I could tell they like lit up. They're like, oh, I want that. Yeah. And so then I changed my Instagram bio to say it. And then I had this woman reach out to me and say, I want to interview you for my podcast. I love that name. And then in the middle of the podcast, she's like, you need to brand your company that. And so I was yeah. like, okay, sure. That's awesome. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> 
So speaking of Instagram and your website, where can people find you? All my handles are NFA money. So Instagram, mm -hmm. NFA money. I'm definitely most active on there. And then my website's NFA money. And then I have a ton of awesome free stuff. I have a ch YouTube channel, NFA money. I do a release every week and lives and all kinds of stuff. And then I have a Facebook group called NFA Moneymaker Lab. And that's awesome. You get a free 30-day mini course in there called 30 Money Making Secrets. All kinds of amazing resources for people. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I like to also ask every guest, what kind of books or whether it be other podcasts or YouTube, I know you mentioned that podcast was big for you when you were getting started on your journey. What ones would you recommend our audience? Definitely my podcast. It's called Max Potential Money. Oh. So Max Potential Money is I have tons of good stuff there. Man, there's so many good ones. The sky's the limit. I'd say book wise, I, it's absolutely essential in terms of money mindset to read Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. That was the first money mm -hmm. book I read and it was life altering. I would say strategy. One thing I would say, just generally speaking, become a master of yourself through learning every single day. That is by far the number one habit that I've implemented to change my reality and that I have all of my people that are in my community do. You know, it's okay if you really want to be successful in life, you've got to change yourself because your outer world is an expression of your inner world. So if you don't like the results you're getting, you've got to change what's within, which takes dedicated, committed energy and time put into yourself. Podcasts I, for business growth. I love Amy Porterfield for online courses. I listen to a lot of I, right now I'm listening to a lot of investment podcasts, having my wealth grow my wealth. So learning a lot of strategy there. Yeah, I could build a big list. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I agree. I think books have been big to me and then podcasts I started listening to, I don't know, four or five years ago and it's just taking me to another level. I love listening and just when you're driving, when you're doing other stuff, it it's, gives you an ability to learn a lot more. So it's just it's always fun to see what people listen to and go from there. But Dr. Man, I love this conversation. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we get to continue to track your journey and have you on again, maybe. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was great to be here.